Welcome back to Biomechanics on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe. In this video, we're going to talk about the sit-to-stand movement. So before we go into all the details of this video, I recommend that you pause the video and find a chair, seat, something to sit in. So sit down, and then just stand up from that seated position. Now, that seems to most of us like a fairly simple task, but it turns out that there's a lot of considerations and biomechanical factors that play a role in that simple action. And so going from a sitting position to a standing position, like you see right here in this diagram, that's just generally called the sit to stand. And so what we're gonna be doing here is we're going to go through the four phases of the sit to stand, We'll talk about the various movement patterns that we see, and then also the various muscles that are required to be active at certain times during this task. All right, so now we're gonna begin with the first phase of the sit to stand, and that is flexion momentum. Now this right here, where you see this person beginning at rest in a seated position to right here, this step right here is flexion momentum. And so it begins really at movement initiation, so practically at rest. You initiate the movement, and then it ends just before liftoff. And by liftoff, what we mean is the moment that your buttocks and thigh come off of the seat. Because obviously when you're sitting on the seat, your buttocks and thigh are on the seat. And so the moment that they come off of the seat, which is called liftoff, that's where this phase ends. Now there's two very important things that have to happen during the flexion momentum phase. And those are momentum generation at the trunk, that's the actual flexion momentum, but also moving the feet backward about 10 centimeters behind the knee. We'll come back to that in just a minute. Okay, so this person's starting at rest. They haven't yet made the decision to stand up. But when they stand up, you'll notice that they bend forward at the hips and you get a trunk flexion. Okay? This trunk flexion shifts the center of gravity anteriorly. So their center of gravity is now more forward. And that's going to be important in order to have the momentum transfer in the next phase. The other thing about this uh, shift forward via this trunk flexion is that it doesn't occur slowly. It actually occurs pretty rapidly. Okay? Um, you probably never thought about that before, but if you just do a fluid sit to stand like you normally would, then this trunk flexion actually occurs pretty quickly. And so we need to generate sufficient flexion momentum in order to be able to transfer a lot of it to the lower extremity in the next phase. So this is a fairly rapid trunk flexion. In fact, remember that momentum is the product of mass and velocity. So if you want more momentum, do it faster. Okay? And so that's the first thing that has to happen in flexion momentum. The other thing is something else that we usually don't even think about. Um, just imagine you're sitting down or you can even try this again. But when you make the decision to actually stand up, unless your feet are already positioned uh, more back, your feet will actually move along the ground posteriorly. You'll actually move your feet back. And this is actually in order to get the proper leverage so that during the extension phase, um, you actually minimize the amount of work that your quads have to do. Okay? Um, if your feet are too far forward, you make this task much more difficult, particularly on your quadriceps. So in this phase, the feet are actually going to move backward. And usually what people will do, without even thinking about it, they'll actually just translate their feet along the ground backwards. And so notice at rest here, his feet are actually right in line with the knee. That's not what we want. We want to move the feet backwards such that uh, when we finish this phase, that the feet are about 10 centimeters behind the knee. And whenever we move the feet backward, what's going to happen is we're going to cause ankle dorsiflexion. Okay? In other words, what's happening is the tibia is actually rotating forward. Okay? Not a huge amount, but because the knee is more or less static here, the knee's not really moving at all, okay? by moving the foot back, we actually kind of rotate this tibia a little bit forward, and that produces ankle dorsiflexion. And so what you can see right here during the flexion momentum phase is that we start to get some tibialis anterior activity. Okay? Remember, tibialis anterior is the primary ankle dorsiflexor. So because we're having an ankle dorsiflexion here, it requires the use of the tibialis anterior muscles. Okay?
So flexion momentum, we need to generate momentum by doing a fairly rapid trunk flexion that gets the momentum forward in order to transfer it in the next phase, and then also move the feet backward, and that's going to produce an ankle dorsiflexion, which is done via the tibialis anterior muscles in each leg. Okay, so now we're going to move into the momentum transfer phase. So the momentum transfer phase begins at liftoff. Remember, liftoff was basically when your buttocks and your thigh were no longer in contact with the seat, and it's going to end at the point where we have maximum ankle dorsiflexion. And in momentum transfer, we're going to use that momentum that was generated by the trunk flexion in the previous stage and really distribute it to the total body, but really more the lower extremity. When we're doing this trunk flexion in the previous phase, flexion momentum, our buttocks and thigh are anchored on the seat, so really this momentum is all upper body. But by taking our buttocks and thigh off of the seat, this flexion momentum is going to be transferred to the total body and really into the legs. We really didn't have any of it in the legs. Now we have it throughout the whole body, including the lower extremities. Okay? And at this point, once we have liftoff, we're no longer seated. Okay? Now there's a few things that are going to happen in this phase. One is obvious, we're going to be lifting off from the seat, which again, buttocks and thigh no longer in contact with the seat. The second thing we're going to have is activation of the quadriceps femoris, particularly vastus lateralis, and that's to prevent excessive knee flexion. Okay, so normally you would think of quads as like pushing up. Pushing up is the next phase. We're not there yet. This is not the upward phase of a squat. That's basically the third step. Right now, all we're doing is we're kind of shifting off of the seat, we're lifting up off of the seat, and transferring the momentum throughout the body instead of just the upper extremity. So we're not using the quads to push up, we're actually using them to prevent excess knee flexion. Think about it, you're no longer on the seat. So if you removed all your quadricep activity, what would be the natural tendency? Well, based on gravity, you would fall right back down, which would be a knee flexion because you'd be basically putting your butt back on the ground or the seat. So to prevent that, to keep excess flexion from occurring, the vastus lateralis of the quadriceps has to become active. And we can actually see that right here. And its job is to prevent excess knee flexion to basically keep us off of the seat. Okay? The third thing that has to happen is increased ankle dorsiflexion even beyond what we had at the end of the flexion momentum phase. And so this tibia is going to be rotated even more forward to produce more ankle dorsiflexion. And by the time we get to the end of the momentum transfer phase, we've hit maximum ankle dorsiflexion. Now, of course, the muscle that's promoting this ankle dorsiflexion is the primary dorsiflexor, tibialis anterior. Okay? Um, however, we also are going to have coactivation of its antagonist, the soleus, which is on the posterior part of the leg. Now why do we have activity of the soleus, which we can actually see right here? That's to prevent excessive tibial forward translation. So we don't want the tibia basically collapsing forward into the floor, we want to actually control the dorsiflexion. And so soleus, being the antagonist of the tibialis anterior, is going to eccentrically contract to prevent excessive dorsiflexion, so basically to prevent too much anterior translation of the tibia. Okay? We don't want the tibia to come too far forward, so the soleus has to co-activate with the tibialis anterior. Um, one thing you can see right here is really at the beginning of this phase is when tibialis anterior is active, but then to prevent it from going further toward the end of this phase, that's when soleus becomes more active. So to sum this up, really the critical events that you have to have during the momentum transfer phase are continued ankle dorsiflexion via the tibialis anterior and then continued hip flexion, uh, which also will help us bring that buttocks off of the seat. All right. One other thing I wanted to mention before we go to the extension phase is that this phase right here, the momentum transfer, has the largest ground reaction force okay, of all four phases of this. In other words, if you were to actually put scales underneath your feet and measure the weight that you see for each one of these phases, it would be highest in this phase. And that's because what you're doing is not only are you putting all your weight on your feet. Okay? Before in this phase, some of it was in the feet, but most of it was actually on the buttocks and the thigh, 
because you're sitting down. But as soon as you lift off, okay, even though you're bent like this, you've now got all your weight on your feet. In addition, because the momentum transfer is going anteriorly and a little bit down, you're applying more force on those theoretical scales. So you would have basically the force due to just your weight, and then also a little bit of downward force because that's the direction of the momentum transfer. Let's move on to the extension phase of the sit to stand. We're gonna begin with maximum ankle dorsiflexion, which is where we left off with in the momentum transfer, and we're gonna end with maximum hip extension. Okay? This is basically, if you wanna think about it this way, the upward phase of a squat. Now, uh, there's several critical events that have to happen here, and it's really just a sequence of lower limb extension. Okay? So we have to have knee extension, hip extension, and ankle extension, which is also called plantar flexion. Now let me explain the plantar flexion right here. So we're beginning at maximum ankle dorsiflexion. Okay? When we do this movement up, when we extend upward to a standing position, notice that the foot doesn't change position, but the tibia will actually move backward on the ankle. So whereas here, maybe this angle between the tibia and the foot might be like, I don't know, 60 degrees, here it's more or less neutral at 90 degrees. That's actually what we call a relative plantar flexion. And normally when we think of plantar flexion, we think of just going up on your tiptoes, right? But because we're actually moving the tibia backwards relative to the foot, we're still getting a plantar flexion. And this is actually gonna be due to the gastroc soleus complex, so the gastrocnemius and the soleus muscles. In fact, we actually see both of those active right here. Um, so they're what are producing this plantar flexion. One way you could also think about it is an ankle extension. The second thing that has to happen is this knee extension. So obviously over here our knees more flexed. We do have quadricep activation via the vastus lateralis in order to basically prevent us from buckling and falling back down to prevent excessive knee flexion. But here the quadriceps, that is the vastus lateralis, is done really to promote that knee extension, to basically take our knee from about 90 degrees right here and go to up to full extension 180 degrees. What you should also notice here is that the activity of the vastus lateralis to produce this extension up, it actually takes less force to do that than it actually did to hold it in this knee flexion to prevent it from buckling. Okay, um, takes less force to actually extend upward, but that's what happens here. And then the third thing that we have to have is hip extension. Okay, and the major hip extensor that we're gonna see is the gluteus maximus. That's not actually shown here in this EMG diagram, but it's the most active of the hip extensors. And so notice again, here we're in a state of hip flexion. And when we wanna stand up, we have to extend the ankle. So plantar flex it, extend the knee, and extend the hip, okay? And when we get to the point of maximum hip extension, that terminates the extension phase, okay? Now, one other thing I wanted to mention about the plantar flexion is that when we're moving this tibia backward over the ankle joint, again, we don't want it to go too far backward, right? Uh, we want to restrain that plantar flexion and control it. So in order to restrain that plantar flexion, the tibialis anterior is going to contract eccentrically. Okay? Um, and that's again to prevent excessive plantar flexion and control that movement, but also to maintain ankle stability. So the gastrocnemius and soleus, they promote the plantar flexion, but the tibialis anterior is controlling it by contracting eccentrically. That's the exact opposite of what we saw here in the dorsiflexion. It was actually the tibialis anterior producing the dorsiflexion and the soleus controlling it eccentrically, okay? But in any case, extension phase is gonna end once we're fully erect like this. Now you might think to yourself when you get up to this position, why is there a fourth phase? Aren't we done? Well, if we stand up like this, it doesn't really do us any good if we fall forward and do a face plant, right? So once we're up, we want to make sure we are stable. Because if we fall down, how does that count as a stand? We just stood up and fell. So we wanna make sure that we can actually maintain this stance. And this is mainly a job of the ankles, believe it or not. There was another video somewhere in this playlist where we talked about RPAs. Those are reactive postural adjustments 
and they are adjustments to posture that are made when there's an unexpected perturbation, basically something that would cause us to lose our balance. One of the strategies to maintain that balance is something called an ankle strategy, and that's used here once we get to erect standing. So what would the perturbation be? Aren't we fully erect and stable? Well, not necessarily. Let's go back to the extension phase. As you're going from this sort of squatted down position to this fully erect posture, what's happening is your center of gravity is actually shifting anteriorly a little bit. And so you actually have sort of a forward momentum. It's just a little bit, but you have a little forward momentum due to the fact that the center of gravity as you're going up is moving forward. And if nothing else happened, that may actually cause you to fall forward and do a face plant. So we have to use what's called an RPA ankle strategy. So this phase begins with maximum hip extension, which is basically the erect posture, and then just ends with really ankle flexion and extension. In other words, ankle dorsiflexion and ankle plantar flexion, depending on which way the sway might occur. Now for most people, the, the sway is going to be a little bit forward because of that anterior shift in the center of gravity. And so for that reason, you're mostly going to have gastrocnemius and soleus acting as the stabilizers. So let's think about it for a second. If you had your center of gravity shifting forward, and so that might tend to cause you to lean forward. Well, that would actually cause the tibia to move forward, right? That would actually produce a dorsiflexion, and that may actually cause you to teeter over and fall forward. You don't want that. So in order to prevent the tibia from moving too far forward, you contract the posterior muscles to prevent it from moving forward. And that's done using the gastrocnemius and the soleus, and it is called an ankle strategy for RPA. So we have a perturbation that's causing us to move the tibia a little bit forward. That's just the forward motion once we're up like this. And so to prevent the tibia from moving forward, which would cause our whole body to move forward, we use the posterior muscles here, gastrocnemius and soleus, to prevent the tibia from moving forward. Conversely, if there was ever a case where we just happened to be moving backward a little bit, then the tibia would be moving backward, and so then I would expect the tibialis anterior to contract here in order to prevent that tibia from moving backward, which would in turn make the whole body move backward, and then you just fall on your butt. Okay? But generally speaking, in most cases, because the center of gravity shifts anteriorly, and we would have a little bit of forward momentum, we're actually going to see the gastrocnemius and soleus be the primary active muscles because the tibia is going to have a tendency to be translating forward. We want to restrain that, so we use the posterior muscles, gastrocnemius and soleus. And the key here is all about stability because it doesn't do you any good to stand up if you're just going to fall down. Hopefully that makes sense. And hopefully going through these four phases of sit to stand gives you an appreciation for a seemingly simple task that we may take for granted, but there's a lot of things that have to happen. And hopefully I gave you something to think about next time you go from a sit to a stand position of all the things that have to happen in concert. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you very much.